Well, good evening. I hope you all had a swell day today. Wasn't that a wonderful morning and a little cooler afternoon? Amen. Amen. One thing's for sure, there was no, two things that were missing today. It didn't rain and it didn't snow. Right? Wisconsin. There's a blood. Yeah, but wait till tomorrow. All right, so if you want to join with me for our first hymn of the evening, it'll be number 308. Are you washed in the blood? And we're going to stand for this one. Are you washed in the blood? Number 308. Father, it says in your word, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And there are many congregations we know that kind of put the blood off to the side, but without the blood of our Savior, we are not cleansed from our sin. We thank you that you declared from time past to time present, Lord, that the only method of salvation is faith on our Lord Jesus Christ, be covered by the blood of the Lamb. We thank you for your love, so much so that you sent your only begotten Son to be that sacrifice for us. We praise you and we thank you for the mercies that you show us each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now being seated, we're going to page over to 295. And 295 is only a sinner. 295. Not have I gotten, but what I received, grace has bestowed it since I have believed. Boasting excluded, pride I embrace, I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Jesus 
must have found me happy my case and now I'm a sinner saved by grace only a sinner saved by grace only a sinner saved by grace this is my story to God be the glory I'm only a sinner saved by grace tears unavailing no merit had I mercy has saved me or else I must die sin had alarmed me fearing God's face but now I'm a sinner saved by grace only a sinner saved by grace only a sinner Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord, for that. And our final hymn of the evening will be number 473. 473. Oh, that will be glory. 473. Oh, when and trials are o'er And I am safe from that beautiful shore Just to be near the dear Lord I adore Will through the ages be glory for me Oh, that will be glory for me
It's good to have you here this evening. Uh, welcome to the people who are joining us live stream. I know I have some regulars in Georgia, and I know that we have some regulars in South Africa. There's others, but we're thankful that you're here with us this evening. And um, we're, we're very grateful to be able to have the life and health to be able to be here. My wife thought she would give it um, a try this evening. Come on out. Uh, we got tired of uh, waiting for uh, the uh, medical establishment to code things right. Um, she has a home nebulizer, and they're going through all kinds of crazy stuff. We just went and bought the medicine, so uh, that should be able to help clear things up. Just before we have a word of prayer, just uh, one more time announcing this. My granddaughter, Emily Victoria Thanius, is uh, graduating, and uh, she will, uh, uh, is a graduation open house on June 4th uh, at uh, 2 to 5. There's a sign-up sheet. It is going to be at Lake Vista Park Pavilion. It's uh, over near Bender Park. It's actually to the north of Bender Park, but there's maps out there. We have the pavilion, so regardless of uh, rain or shine, or in the event of snow, <laughs> doubt it in June, but uh, we're going to uh, uh, be there at Lake Vista Park. So you're invited to join us. Do sign up so that we have enough food for everybody who comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, uh, thank you for intervening for us. We each have areas where we can praise your name. Uh, I'm glad Linda's doing better. We just pray that you'd strengthen her and help her to get rid of that upper respiratory challenge. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, we uh, certainly are asking for uh, divine intervention for uh, Sister Holly. Uh, we had a meeting last night. She was there, so we just ask you to intervene uh, for her, uh, for Susan, uh, Lord, for a number of others who have uh, challenges that they're facing, um, uh, we would think of uh, Nancy S. as well. We'd commit her to you. Uh, Lord, we uh, certainly would ask your intervention for a weird thing that's happened in the United States. Baby formula um, is, uh, there's been a recall in some, and uh, the Alpha Women's Center, even though it was donated, got... Uh, uh, a payment for the uh, bad formula that they sent back, and we're grateful for that. But they can't find any formula to replace it, and mothers all over the United States are finding themselves in that uh, in that situation. So, Lord, just give wisdom and guidance, um, perhaps to be able to uh, look to the old ways where they took care of babies and uh, some of the. Uh, home recipes for uh, feeding babies, too. We commit that to you. Uh, Lord, we pray that we might rejoice uh, in the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, I'm certainly asking you to divinely intervene because tomorrow we start knocking on doors. Uh, looking forward to that, and I'm thankful for uh, the flyers and things that uh, um, uh, Sarah and Patty and Emily have uh, put together, and uh, Lord, give us good success, uh, the ability to verbally share the gospel as we go out and knock on doors this year. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The work of the Holy Spirit in the world, let's look at John 16, uh, 8 through 11. John 16, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, it is chapter 16, and now I'm beginning verse 8. It says, uh, when he come... And we know who he's talking about because verse 7, Jesus said he's going to send the Comforter. So the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And when he come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, and of judgment because the Prince of this world world is judged. Well, let me lay some groundwork here. Uh, this passage, of course, is focusing on the work of the Holy Spirit 
uh, in the world. Uh, Jesus is talking about uh, the Holy Spirit coming and uh, uh, convicting of sin, righteousness, and judgment once that he's been crucified and then he ascends to the Father. And so I want to begin by making some observations and, and get you to put your mind in gear here. Uh, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Comforter in, in verse 7. Let's, uh, I just want to read the entire verse. I didn't read it uh, uh, previously, just uh, lifted up the word. But verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for me that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So, Verse 7, he's called the Comforter. And uh, we already looked at that. If you were uh, looking at the Greek word, is parakletos. And what that uh, is talking about is someone who is sent to assist, someone who's a helper, uh, someone who is an advocate. And I read to you last week, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. Just want to refresh your memory, uh, reading to you once again. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. All right, I will get it here. Oh, pages are sticky this evening. It says, My little children, John writes, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. That's the goal, that ye sin not. And if any man sin... Here it is, it's the same word translated comforter in John 16. We have an advocate, a defense attorney, one who comes alongside to help. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now while it's the goal not to sin, if anybody says they don't sin after they're saved, you know what they are? They're a liar, and the word's not in them. Uh, I've told you many times, and um, it's not original with me, it's original with Warren Wiersbe. Christians aren't sinless, but Christians do sin less. Uh, and that's what our goal is to be. Uh, so we have an advocate. Now, this Holy Spirit's ministry is to believers. Uh, this one who comes alongside to help, the one who's an advocate, the one who assists. He is an advocate and a defender of believers in times of need. Now we shift gears when we come to uh, John chapter 16 and verse 13. Uh, it's, he's called the spirit of truth. And then even when we're looking at John chapter 16 and verse 8, it says uh, that uh, um, it's, it's the, the spirit of of truth as well, but it says in verse um, 13 that Jesus is the, or the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And so my whole point is lifting this up. The Holy Spirit always tells the truth. Always, you know, elucidates the truth. He always proclaims the truth. And what I forgot to put in there, he always lifts up Jesus. He doesn't want to be worshipped himself. He points all worship to the Lord. But that does bring me back to verses 8 through 11. Christ points out that the Holy Spirit's ministry in relationship to the world is completely different than his ministry to believers. Um, he moves from a defensive ministry for believers. It's quite different now. He is moving to an offensive ministry of confronting the unsaved world. Uh, and uh, he is not an advocate, but he confronts the world as a prosecutor and a judge. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Um, here he comes. He's going to reprove the world of these things. So he's confronting them. He's the prosecutor. He's the judge. The first thing that I would like to take up in this has to do with the, the word reprove. Um, it's elengsi in the Greek, six 
1515 in, in your Strong's. And it is a legal word that means bring to light. It means to expose. It means to refute. It means to pronounce a verdict. It means to convict. It means to find a person guilty. Woo! That's pretty strong. There's uh, no longer is uh, it's a completely uh, opposite end of the spectrum in God's dealing with believers as he comforts them, as he advocate for them. Now uh, he convicts them of their personal guilt. Now, believers... You all know that we are to be witnesses. And uh, that means that we're supposed to share the word. The Holy Spirit is the prosecuting attorney. And the unsaved are the guilty prisoners. I, want, I just want you to think about that a minute. Believers are the, the witnesses against them. Uh, and uh, uh, we share the word of God. There's none righteous, no, not what? One, all right? Uh, sinners love darkness rather than what? Light, because their deeds are evil. So uh, believers are the witnesses as they share the word of God. The Holy Spirit's the prosecuting attorney, and the unsaved are the guilty uh, persons and guilty prisoners. But here's the cool part about it. I, I, I just praise the Lord for it, because once I was there, the purpose of this indictment is not to condemn them to hell. It's to bring them to salvation. Man. And that's why you can say in John 3.16, we'll look at that whole passage a little bit later, for God so loved the world. But remember, sinners can't be saved until they realize they are lost. So the purpose, again, of this indictment is not to condemn, but to bring them to salvation. The Holy Spirit works on the minds of the unsaved to show them what the truth of God's word is. I'd like to go a little bit more on the issue of reproof now. To be sure, no sinner will ever repent and believe the gospel without the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not going to happen. Because as convincing as our words might be, it's uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And without the convictions of the Holy Spirit, nobody's saved. The Holy Spirit has to work on the sinner's mind or the sinner is never going to get saved. The Holy Spirit has to break through and first of all, uh, the sinner has a love for sin. Sinners love darkness. Sinners love sin. Men are not only in darkness, uh, they're not only blinded, and they're double blinded when you bring Satan into the picture. If our gospel be hid, it's hid unto them that are lost. They love darkness. They reject the light. They pursue sin with a deep affection. On their own, they are not going to repent because, as it says in Ephesians, they are dead in trespasses and sin. They are under the control of the God of this world. Their eyes are blinded to God by the God of this world, and they're alienated from the life of God, as we read in Ephesians chapter 2. You can read that all for yourself right there. However... I want you to know, even though all that's true, this is really not the focus when it says right here that he will reprove the world. The focus is not on the individual sinner. Um, and it's, it's, uh, uh, he will reprove the world collectively of sin. This verse says that the Holy Spirit will re re reprove the world. This is not specifically speaking of an individual, but of all individuals, because they are all lawbreakers. And turn with me to John chapter, or John, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. 
very familiar in Romans chapter 3. Um, uh, we see in verse now 19, it says, Now we know that uh, whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That's what this taught. The, the Holy Spirit comes to uh, confront the whole world that they are lost in the darkness of sin. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Here it is, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, how does this happen where they are confronted? It's by the preaching of the word of God and the testifying from the scripture. That's why I say when you share your testimony, saturate it with scripture. As I'd said many times, the Holy Spirit of God uses the Holy Word of God. And we read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, preach the Word. Be instant, in season, not a season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Jesus is saying to his disciples, the Holy Spirit is going to reveal the truth. And what that truth was first called was the Apostles' Doctrine. And then it was also called um, earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. It ends up now as God brings these things to their mind and moves and gives words to the Apostle Paul and Peter, it ultimately becomes the Scripture. But remember, the only Scripture that they had in that day was Old Testament Scripture. And we know in Acts chapter uh, 8 what happens. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading in Isaiah, and so uh, Philip got up in the chariot and preached to him Jesus from the Old Testament. Um, and so... By means of the revelation of the Holy Spirit, you are going to be able to indict and prosecute and convict the world um, uh, before God. Indictment, conviction, prosecution, that is what we do when we preach the gospel. The good news makes no sense, really, the good news makes no sense at all if it's not delivered from a, sev a severe punishment and violation of the law perspective. Why would anybody want to be saved if they don't realize they're lost? And that's what the Holy Spirit is talking about, convicts the world of sin. You're all lost. You love your sin. And so... We know that the preaching and testifying of the believer is how the Holy Spirit works. Either have your notes or turn to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. I'm going to turn my mic off just for a minute. Holy Spirit... In salvation, they go hand in hand. And this is what it's talking about, Acts 1.8. It says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come unto you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and on all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. So my point is... The gospel is going to have no effect if people don't realize that they're sinners first. You gotta get them lost before they can be found. You gotta get them lost before they can be found. They need to realize that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. 
Now let's look at the specific sin now that we've talked about the reproof. <coughs> what is the specific sin? Well, verse 9. So let's go back to John chapter 16. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Not believing Jesus is the Savior, not believing that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, is the only sin that will ultimately send people to hell. Let's flip back to John chapter 8 and in verse 24. I said therefore unto you, John 8 and verse 24, uh, that ye shall die in your sins if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Though all men are depraved, you know, we're cursed because we violated God's law and we have a sin nature. You've heard me say it many times, we're sinners by nature and sinner by choice. What ultimately damns any person to hell is their unwillingness to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And that's where John 3, 16 through 21 comes in. You're familiar with part of it, but I'm going to focus in on 19 most of all, but John 3, 16, starting there, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. Now here it is, and this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world, and as I already quoted, men love darkness, they love sin. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deed should be reproved. But he that doth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. People would not believe on Christ if it were not for the persuasive work of the Holy Spirit. Millions of people are locked in spiritual darkness. They've never heard the truth. Others are blinded by Satan and don't accept the truth. And our responsibility is to tell them the truth. Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But once he's gone, he said, ye are the light of the world. Uh, our responsibility is to tell the truth. And as we do it, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that persuades them. Now let us testify to the reality of Jesus Christ in our lives, both with our lips and, and our lives, uh, and let them know that he's alive and he has delivered us from sin and he's forgiven us and he has changed us. The Spirit will use our testimonies to persuade others to come to know Christ. Let's move on to righteousness now. You know, um, in crucifying Jesus, remember what the Jews thought. They, they accused him of being a blasphemer. Uh, in crucifying Jesus, the Jewish people showed that they thought Jesus Christ was unrighteous because uh, to them only wicked person would be hanged on a tree and thus be under God's curse. If you have your Bibles, flip over to Deuteronomy 21, 23. Deuteronomy 21, 23. It says, The body shall not remain all night upon a tree, 
But thou, uh, it says, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that is hanged is accursed of God. And that's talking about crucified, hanged on a tree. Uh, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Now, very interesting. Flip over to Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 now. In Galatians 3, verse 13, you can probably quote it. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. How did he do it? He was hanged on the tree himself. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written. Where is it written? We just read where it's written. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Well, here's the deal. The Jews, they said, ah, wicked person, crucified, cursed of God. But here's the deal. I love it. The resurrection and the ascension vindicated Jesus Christ as God's righteous servant. He was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Uh, let's look at Acts chapter 3, 14 and 15. In Acts chapter 3, 14 and 15, it says, But ye denied the Holy One. And, and here we have Peter admonishing. He's preaching to these people. He says, But ye denied the Holy One and the Just One and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and have killed the Prince of Life and then here's what it says. Whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof uh, we are witnesses. They killed the prince of life, but God hath raised him from the dead. Man, oh man, that's powerful stuff there. Um, the spirit convicts men of their faulty view of Jesus uh, when the gospel is stressed, particularly the resurrection, and that is proclaimed. And that's what 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, when it tells you and explains what the gospel is. That Christ was uh, died, buried, and the third day rose again. Up. From, I love singing that song, Up From the Grave He Arose. But there's more to it than just that. I want you to think a little deeper. Uh, you'll remember that according to Romans chapter 4, verse 25, that Jesus was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. That's what it says. Jesus Christ returned to the Father because he had completed his work here. First John 4, 14, the Father sent the Son to be what? The Savior of the world. And when he died on the cross, he died a judgment death. That's why he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God can't look on sin. And so he was paying for the sins of the whole world there on the cross, and God turned his back. He took my guilt, he took your guilt, and he died in my place, he died in your place. He was delivered for our offenses, but he was raised so that we could be declared not guilty before God. That's what justification is. He was raised from the dead that you and I might not only have our sins subtracted, I want you to think about that, but that we might have his, righteous, his righteousness added to our account. That's very important because I need righteousness. You need righteousness. 
Because even any righteousness that we would have would be filthy rags. We don't have any righteousness of our own. It's, it's not enough. You couldn't stand in heaven. It's not enough uh, to have your sins forgiven. You cannot stand in the presence of God um, <laughs> if you were nothing but a pardoned criminal. Christ gave over his righteousness. Now, that is the righteousness Paul spoke of in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, that I might win Christ and be found in him, here it is, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith, the faith of Christ, that the righteousness which is in God, which is of God by faith. So we can't stand on our own righteousness, but it is the righteousness that we have in Christ. He not only subtracted our sins, he added his righteousness to our account. If we are to have any standing before God, we must be in Christ and have his righteousness. Either we have as much a right to be in heaven as Christ himself, or we have no right to be there at all. I'm saved. He was delivered for my offenses and raised for my justification, raised for my righteousness. Finally, judgment, the third area. The Holy Spirit's convicting work concerning judgment. It's really cool. I don't know what other word to use. It's awesome. That's overused too, but it's wonderful. Um, the death of Jesus Christ, uh, it's, it's um, meant the condemnation of Satan. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, um, let's go back to verse um, 13, Colossians 2, 13, and put it a little bit in context. And you being dead in your sins in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, trespasses blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and he, here it is, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. The demonic forces, the principalities and powers, he triumphed over them. He triumphed over the Prince of the world, John 14, in verse 30, just says this, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of the world has come and hath nothing in me. He didn't have anything to accuse Jesus of that was legitimate, but he defeated the devil. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. In Hebrews chapter 2, down to verse 14, we read this. It says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself took uh, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil and deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage for verily he took not 
on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Christ Jesus defeated the devil who had the power of death. And though Satan was defeated on the cross, he's still kicking up a fuss. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Why is he kicking up such a fuss? Because he knows his time is short. He knows his time is short. And uh, praise God for that. Uh, like a condemned criminal, um, he's condemned, but he's still active. But his execution is coming. That's talking about the devil. Let's look at Revelation 20, verse 2, and then 7 through 10. It says this, And he laid hold, Revelation 22, on uh, the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him <clears throat> a thousand years. We know it's loosed a little season, but... And then in verse 7... <clears throat> through 10 and when the thousand years had expired Satan was loosed out of his prison and shall go forth to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the compass points of the earth Gog and Magog uh, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea and they went up on the breadth of the earth to compass the camp of the saints that's uh, the thousand years where we rule and reign with Christ. The beloved city, but here's what happened. Fire came from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Satan is a defeated enemy. He knows his end. That's why he's trying to deceive as many as possible. You know, people in rebellion should take note of Satan's defeat. They should. And fear the Lord who holds the power as the judge. As the fact of coming judgment, both of Satan and men, is proclaimed... The Spirit convicts people and prepares them for salvation. Let's look at one last passage of Scripture, Acts 17, 30, and 31. Acts 17, 30, and 31 says, because he hath appointed a day, oh, back up, Acts 17, 30, and the, time, and the time of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Well, there's a judgment day coming, and that's why in John 16, we've looked at the sin because they believe not the righteousness because Jesus Christ was righteous and went to his father and Satan is judged and those who don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ are going to join Satan for all of eternity first in hell and then to the eternal hell which is called the lake of fire all right, that's as far as we're going to go this evening. I'm going to have uh, Randy take us off the air. Join us uh, this coming Sunday. We'll be going back in our study of uh, Philippians and 
We'll be looking at Satan's lie relating to the geologic column as we continue that in Sunday school. And additionally, a new name of God in the evening service. Thanks for joining us.